I God, how great thou art. Then sing my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God.
turned the theater into a revival center. We sang there that night. I heard a lady sing this song. And I'd heard it time and time before, but it struck me forcibly that night. And I knew that I could never be worthy of God's love for me. But I believe down deep in my heart, had I been the only person in the world, God would have sent his dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for me. I talked to a doctor one time, and he said, what do you do for a living? And at that time, I was on the road with a quartet. And I said, I sing gospel music. He said, oh, I've not got too much truck with religion. I said, doctor, I don't have religion. I've got salvation. I said, the black man in Africa has got religion. He worships the sun, the moon, the stars. Everybody has religion. But I said, until you come face to face and have a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, you won't have salvation. I said, salvation is a personal thing. It's as personal as your very own innermost being, your thoughts, and the very beats of your heart. But I'm glad tonight, by the application of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, I have been made worthy. I'd like for you to listen to a song written by Ira Stanfield, Unworthy. Unworthy am I of the grace that he gave, unworthy to hold to his hand. Amazed that a king would reach down to a slave, such love I cannot understand unworthy unworthy a beggar in bondage and alone but he made me worthy and now by his grace his mercy has made me his own. Listen, my sorrow and sickness laid stripes on his back. My sin caused the blood that he shed. My faults and my failures have woven the crown of thorns that he wore on his head. Unworthy am I of the glory to come. Unworthy with angels to sing, but I thrill just to know that he loved me so much. A pauper, yet I walk with the King, unworthy, unworthy. A beggar in bondage and alone. Oh, but he made me worthy. And now by his grace, his mercy has made me his own. Thanks. You ought to believe about two hours of preaching is coming. Amen? Amen. I tell you, and I appreciate the blessings that God's already blessed us with by being here tonight. I appreciate the Lord saving me. 
I, I'm unworthy. I should have I had judgment instead of mercy, but I'm glad the Lord saved me. And then I'm glad the Lord called me to preach. Amen. That's, you know, I'm unworthy to preach, but I'm glad he called me, and what a blessing that is. And to have all these preachers here, I tell you it's a blessing to see them and all of the visitors and then the folks here at uh, East Side. Why, we're glad, and I, I just appreciate you coming. Now, I want us to have a theme this week, and I'll mention it every night, the Lord willing. And uh, I hope that you'll keep it in mind. I used it the other night or the other week in a meeting. The Lord wants to do something for you tonight. Not the one next to you, but you tonight. God didn't let you come to this meeting without wanting to do something for you. And I don't know about you, but he's already blessed me, praise the Lord. Say amen. And I appreciate the blessings of the Lord. And I'm just thankful tonight to be here. Choir did wonderful. And I appreciate that. And these that play the instruments, and Brother Lou, you did good tonight. Praise God. I tell you, that's that unworthy and all that good singing. How great thou art. was a tremendous blessing. And Brother Phil did good, and we appreciate you coming and being in the service tonight. In a moment, we're going to turn in our Bibles, and I won't get right in the message. Let me say a word or two about tomorrow night, and then Wednesday night, and maybe Thursday night. I'm going back and preaching our old crusade messages. Tomorrow night, I want to speak on the scourge of the Lord. If you have to miss any service, don't miss the one tomorrow night. Bring somebody with you. Come praying. Believe that God is going to do something for you. And I'll speak the Lord willing tomorrow night on the scourge of the Lord. And then Wednesday night, I'm going to bring a message that uh, I guess I've had more people uh, to ask me to preach concerning after death. And I, I hope that you'll plan to be with us. Let me give you just a few of the points in that message. I had a man several years ago to come up to me and say, Preacher, can you tell me what my loved one in heaven is doing now? And so I went home and I took my Bible and I prepared a sermon on, Do you have a loved one in heaven? You say, Preacher, I don't have a loved one in heaven. Well, sooner or later, the casket's going to roll in your house. And sooner or later, there'll be a loved one. Let me give you something never to say if a loved one is a saved loved one when he dies. Never say, I lost my mother if she was a Christian. Never say, I lost my daddy if he is a Christian. If you lose something, you don't know where it is. And when my mother died... I knew where she was going, and I know where she is now. See, I didn't lose her. Praise God, she got promoted or graduated, and that's a blessing. But I've heard people say, I lost mother. No, I didn't lose mother. Uh, I'm glad I know where she is tonight. But I'm going to answer five questions. Now, let me say this, and I want to be mean, and I've said it, and other preachers have said it. Your loved ones are not walking on streets of gold. They're not. So I'm going to answer five questions. I'm going to answer first, what really happened when your mother died or that precious old Christian daddy died? What really happened at death? I'm going to tell you what happens from the Word of God. Number two, I'm going to answer the question, what are they doing now? What are your loved ones doing now in heaven? When I was a little boy, I used to love bananas. I mean bananas. Oh, I, I like them now, but somebody said, when I, when I was a boy, I liked bananas. Lady said to me, said, you like a little bowl of banana pudding? I said, yes, but I like a big one better. Say amen right there. <laughs> but I had the idea when I got to heaven, I'd sit under a banana tree that had zippers on. Just reach up and get one. And I had the idea when I got to heaven, I'd pluck a harp. Did you ever have that idea? All right, I want you to come. Thirdly, I'm going to answer this question. And not only what are they doing, but do they know what we're doing? Does your mother in heaven know what's going on down here? If so, how much? I'll tell you. And then number four, I'm going to answer a question that all of you have asked. When I see my baby again, will I recognize that baby? When I see my mother again, will I recognize she's my mother? Will we recognize one another? And then last, what the home going or the death of the Christian should say to you and should say to me. I gave you the outline, the one I'm going to preach on. Do you have a loved one in heaven? Don't miss it. Thursday night, the Lord willing, I'm going to speak on, I'll meet you in the rapture. In fact, I'll try to speak on different subjects each night. 
And I believe God will bless you. Now, Sunday afternoon, we'll have a big rally service here. And I want to speak on the subject, what happens when a Jezebel gets in the White House? And I want you to come. You'll want to hear that. You say, I know. No, you don't. You think you do. But you be with us. I spoke on that subject in Detroit the other day. Had a great crowd of folks and nobody went out disappointed. Now you say, oh, I will. Well, if you, if you don't agree with the Bible, you will. But if you agree with the Bible, because all I'll say will be from the Bible. And if you take the word of God, well, then you'll believe that. And we'll have a great time. Now, if you remember last evening, and I'll talk about the other services. Boy, we have one for Saturday night and Friday night. And I'll talk about those a little later. But let me remind you tonight, what is the Lord desiring to do for you? What does God desire to do for you in this service? The Lord wants to do something for you. And the Lord wants to do something for me. And every night we'll follow that. And I believe God will help us. I announced last night, I'd speak on the subject tonight. Where is the beef? A little grandmother <clears throat> made a million and a half dollars or two, hundred million. Uh, on that little jingle, where is the beef? And let me say something. She opened a hamburger bun and there wasn't anything but a pickle there. If you have a hamburger and there's no meat there or no beef, you don't have much of a hamburger. And the real thing about a hamburger is the beef. And tonight, I'm going to answer the question, where is the beef? Now, tomorrow, if you meet somebody who stayed home to watch television tonight and didn't come to the crusade, don't tell them where the beef is. Say amen right there. Don't let them know. Just let it be a secret. Now, in a moment, I'm going to turn to Luke chapter 15. And I have ten sermons on the prodigal son. But I'm only going to preach one of them tonight. Aren't you glad? The best sermon I have on the prodigal son... It's the prodigal son is a type of the Jew. Uh, the prodigal son is a type of the Jew. The Jew went out in the far country. But one of these days, the Jew is coming back home. Amen? Now, God is not through with the Jew. And then I have a sermon that this is a type of a man that's a backslider away from God. And then I have a sermon that the prodigal son it's the type of the sinner. But tonight, I'm going to preach on where is the beef. And I'll be, I believe if you'll pray that when you leave here tonight, it, it, you can say, God bless my heart. Now, you know in Israel, let me give you this, and we'll stand and read from the 15th chapter of Luke. In Israel, they make a, a big to-do over a son. When a son is born in Israel, they dance. They, they play music. They rejoice. There's something about a son. But here a man had two sons in our story, and they were different. Now let me give you something. Don't try to make all of your sons or daughters alike. They have different personalities, and you'll make a mistake when you try to make your children alike. And you better accept their individual personalities. And here's a man that had two sons, and the younger. I love him, and I respect him more than I do the elder. See, the elder was one, he was pharisaical. He never did do anything wrong. You can't do much for people that won't confess that they, they've sinned. You can't do much for a fellow that says, I'm better than anybody else. Uh, listen, you better, do, listen, you better see yourself as God sees you. And when you see yourself as God sees you, beloved, it makes a great difference. But in this story that I'm going to read to you, if you know anything about literature, I used to study literature. I don't know why I ever studied the mess. But uh, I read all the stories, Brian, Kelly, Wordsworth, and Keats, and Shakespeare, and on and on and on. But I was amazed to find in a tremendous book, not the Bible, that the most complete short story in the annals of literature is found in Luke chapter 15. And it's the story that has all the ingredients of a story. And it's a story of a boy that left home. Now, if you've never left home, this may not be as, as emotional as it is to me. I remember once when I left home. In fact, I remember twice. I remember when I was about 14, I didn't like home. I said to my daddy, I'm going to run away. And instead of getting a psychiatrist for me, instead of, you know, uh, uh, buying me a new Mercedes Benz, he said, hit the road and don't come back. 
I went about a mile down the road and I turned around and said, it's a pretty good place after all up there where I live. And I didn't leave. But here's a young man. Here's a young man that leaves home. Here's a young man. I'm going to give you three days in his life. There are a lot of days in your life. And tonight I'm going to speak on the days in the life of the prodigal. But I want you to look in your Bible, if you will, and stand with me all of the house quickly. Uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Let me say this. Luke chapter 14 gives you earth's madness. Luke chapter 15 gives you heaven's gladness. Luke chapter 16 gives you hell's sadness. So sandwiched in between uh, chapter 14 and chapter 16 is heaven's gladness when there's rejoicing over one sinner that repents. Now, that was a good song to the choir tonight, but nobody in heaven shouted over that. That was a good song tonight, uh, Brother Luke, but nobody shouted over that. And many of you preachers have preached great sermons, but nobody in heaven shouts over your sermon. But I'll tell you what happens when an old sinner gets up and starts home to God. Likewise, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angel of God. Boy, something happens when sinners come home to Jesus. They have a jubilee over there in that city. So would you note with me, please, from the Word of God tonight. I'm going to begin reading with verse 11. And the Bible said, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, look this way now, and when he had spent all, if you decide you don't need God, and if you decide you don't want to go to heaven, and if you decide that you don't need the church, and if you decide that you don't want to be around Christians, brother, you'll find one day that you'll have spent everything you have. And boy, you'll be in a mess. And when he had spent all, look what the Bible said, there rose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went out and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him in the fields to feed the swine. And he would have felt... I have fain, he would have fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, oh, happy day when a man comes to himself. The Bible said when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of the hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now look this way before I read the next verse, please. Uh, I want you to see something. In type or in the personality of God's great power and sovereignty. This is the only place that God ever got in a hurry. You see, this is a type of God the Father here. Now, God didn't get in a hurry when he created all there is in six days and rested on the seventh. God's in no hurry tonight. Boy, I want to tell you something. God is in no hurry. But when that prodigal started home ragged and tired, the Bible said the Father saw him afar off, had compassion and ran and fell on his neck. If Father got in a hurry to get that old boy and to tell him that he loved him. Now notice, and kissed him. Verse 21, And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to the servants, Bring the best robe. Stop right there. God always puts the best on you. Boy, I, I tell you, I hear people say, God's never been good. God's been good to me. Oh, I tell you, when I think about what God has done and what he wants to do for me, Somebody said, what does he want to do? A lot more than I'll let him. Amen. God would do more for this church if you'd let him. God would do more for you preachers if you'd let him. God would do more for you mothers if you'd let him. But a lot of us don't want to let him. And he brought the best. You know, sometimes we give God the leftovers. Hey, leftovers. You know that? Leftovers. God don't want your leftovers. First, he wants your tithes. Say amen right there. Amen. Well, somebody said, that'll kill a meeting. Not if you're right with God, it won't kill a meeting. God wants those ties. Amen. What a blessing that is. I was preaching on Abraham the other night, and I said he was first called Abram. 
and he went down and paid tithes to Melchizedek, who's a type of Jesus. And God changed the, his name and put ham on it. And if you're eating fat back, try tithe, then God put some ham on your name. Say amen right there. <laughs> amen. Look at the scripture now. Look at the scripture. And he said him, no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto the servants, bring the best robe and put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. Now here's where the beef is, verse 23. And bring hither the fatted calf. Here's where it is. It's not in a far country. The devil doesn't have it down there. You hear me? The real and the genuine is never in the devil's territory. It's always in the father's house. And he said, bring... Uh, hither the fatted calf, kill it, let's eat and be merry. Now listen to what he said. For this my son was dead and was alive again. He was lost and found, and they began to be merry. Oh, happy day. What a day they had. They rejoiced. The boy had come home. What a happy day when your boy gets saved. What a happy day when your daughter gets saved. What a happy day when your loved ones come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad they, they had a happy day. This boy came home. Would you be seated? And while you're seated, I'm going to pray and bring you the message. Father, we thank you tonight for every blessing. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your mighty power in this service. Now I pray that men will not see a preacher, but may they see the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that in this crusade that we'll, we'll be so in love with souls and helping people that need something from God. I pray tonight that every word that shall be spoken shall be spoken attentively from the Spirit of God. And I pray that when we leave here tonight, we'll be able to rejoice together and remember that day when we came to ourselves and said, we're going home, we're going home. Now speak and we'll praise you because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Beloved, I want to speak tonight on where is the beef or the story of the prodigal. And Luke 15 is the great lost chapter. You need to study the Bible and take the great chapters of the Word of God. Here's one and it's called the lost chapter. You say, why? Because there are three lost things in this chapter. They start with S. Notice them. Now. First of all, there's a sheep. I love a sheep. I don't have much respect for goats, but praise God, I love the sheep. I believe that we're called the sheep of this pastor, and he's the great shepherd. There's something precious about a little sheep. And in the story, the Bible said, what manner of man having a hundred sheep, if he lose one, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go out to the bleaky mountain of sin and he searches and he searches till he finds it. Oh, I want to tell you, I remember I was that black sheep and the ninety and nine were safe in the fold, but the good shepherd came and found me and I'm glad he reached away down. Pick me up, praise the Lord, placed me on his shoulders and said, rejoice, I found the sheep that was lost. Now, brother, that'll put you on shouting ground. When when you think about being away from God on the cold mountain of sin and the good shepherd coming out in the cold out on the mountain and, and searching until he finds you. And so we find the sheep, something about that lost sheep. Then secondly, the silver. The Bible said, what woman having ten pieces of silver? If she lose one, does not look and search and she gets a candle and, and a broom and she looks until she finds that piece that was lost. Now let me say one thing about the silver. The silver did not lose itself. It was lost because of the fault of another. Now I'd hate to be some mothers at the judgment seat of Christ when that daughter will stand there and say, Mother, I stumbled over you. I want you to know I'd hate to be a parent and have my child in the day of judgment to condemn me for my hypocritical living. I don't want my children to rise up and say, Daddy, I couldn't get to Jesus because of your life. I believe mothers ought to be holy and righteous, and I believe daddies ought to be God-fearing. But the Bible said we have the sheep, and the Bible said, second, we have the silver. And then when we come to the son, the Bible said, what manner of man having two sons? 
Now the first was the elder. He was the pharisaical type fellow. He never did do anything wrong. He didn't go out in the far country. But he stood over there in a, a kind of a self-righteous spirit. But there was one called the prodigal. And if you have your pencil tonight, I want you to jot down three days in the life of the prodigal. Number one, there's a sad day. Number two, there's a bad day. And number three, there's a glad day. Now you don't, I want to tell you something. I'm glad I didn't have to stop with that first day. I'm glad I don't have to stop with the second day. But oh happy day, that glad day when that prodigal comes back where the beef is. But let's notice these days, if you will. Here's a sad day. And many of you will have sad days in your life. I can't get up here and promise you that every day will be rosy. I can't promise you that the sun will shine upon you every day and that you'll not have any problems. But I'll tell you what I can promise you. If you're saved and you love Jesus, there's someone will be with you every day of your life. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And what a blessing that is. You say, preacher, why was it a sad day? He left God. He left home and he left friends. Any time a girl or a boy or a mother or a daddy leaves God and leaves home and leaves friends, mister, it's a sad day. What a pitiful sight that is. You say, why was it sad? There are three reasons. Number one, he refused his father's love. I want to tell you, a man must be heartless. He must not have a heart that can stand and hear about the love of God and refuse such love. I want you to know when I was a little boy, I heard an old preacher preach, God so loved the world. He took me to Calvary. I got so close, I could hear the dripping of the blood. I could hear the heartbeat of the Son of God. And I could hear him say, I love you. Oh, listen to me, a man, a woman that can refuse the Father's love. I want to tell you, you're mighty hard-hearted when you can turn down such love as the Calvary love. No one ever loved you like Jesus. And here's a young man. He refuses his Father's love. That's sad. Sometimes I preach in South Georgia. And I was down in South Georgia years ago, and I went to a grave of a dear old man. His son killed him, not with a gun, not with a knife, uh, his son not po didn't poison him. His son grieved his daddy to death. Uh, he, the boy drank and doped. Uh, and that old daddy would go to jail and pay him out uh, and put his arms around him and say, Son, I love you. And that boy would shove him aside and say, I do not want your love. Uh, and he, he did that over and over again. Uh, jailhouse after jailhouse. Uh, till one day the old father came to him and walked in the jail and went into the cell and fell over with a heart attack. And as the old man was dying, he reached up and said, Son, before I die, would you receive the love I want to give you? That boy spit on that old daddy in South Georgia and said, I don't want your love. That man died of a broken heart. But you think about God in heaven tonight that loves Elizabeth. And you think about such love as sending his only begotten son. And when people can refuse that kind of love, it's a sad day in your life. It's a sad day in any man's life. Number two, not only did, was it a sad day because he refused the Father's love. Secondly, it was a sad day because he received his portion. Now, he deserved it. It was his. He received his portion without gratitude. He never had any thanksgiving in his heart. Oh, he had no gratitude. I want to tell you something tonight. I'm glad God let me live. Hallelujah. God doesn't obligate himself to let me live. Now, I've died twice technically. Dr. Bloomberg in Atlanta, he said to me, Mr. Jackson, he said, did you know you died twice? I said, I'm scriptural. He said, scriptural? I said, yes, twice dead and plucked up with the roots. Say amen right there. Praise God, I want you to know, my friend, it's a blessing that God lets me live. I'm grateful that he lets me breathe tonight. My wife's uncle is coming all the way from Mobile, Alabama, 
I trust Wednesday night. And he can't breathe good. He has to carry a little apparatus with him so he can breathe. And he told me the last time I talked to him, he said, Maze, I'm glad I can breathe with this thing. I want you to know, mister, here in Elizabethan or wherever you're from, you ought to get on your knees and sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. You ought to raise your hands in thanksgiving and in gratitude. One of the great sins in Romans chapter 1, the Bible says, that neither were they thankful. They, they said, God, you owe it to us. We're not going to praise you. But I want you to know, my friend, here's a boy. And he refused his father's love. He received his portion without any gratitude. I was preaching in Mount Airy a couple of years ago, and a man came in named Easter, and he wrote a little chorus that goes like this. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. I've got shoes on my feet and roof over my head and a fine family. And he came up after the service and he said, Brother Mays, I understand that you like that song. I said, I sure do. I'm glad I've got a roof over my head. I've got shoes on my feet. I'm glad, praise God, I've got a fine family tonight. Oh, you say, preacher, there ought to be thanksgiving and gratitude in our hearts. And here's a boy. What a sad day. He said, give me. And he received his portion without any, any thanksgiving or gratitude. Number, number three, it was a sad day because he rebelled against his father's respect and honor. You know one reason I told that doctor I couldn't die? You know why I told him I couldn't die? I said, I honored my mother and my daddy when I was small. My Bible said, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long <laughs> upon this earth. Uh, let me tell you, you're not to tell your mother, I'll not do it. Uh, you're not to sash your mother. Uh, you're not to treat your mother as an old woman and call your daddy an old man. Uh, listen, we need to have respect for them. Uh, and the Bible said, Honor thy father and thy mother uh, that thy days may be long upon this earth. Uh, oh, this boy didn't... Oh, listen, he rebelled against it. Uh, he didn't care about the name of that daddy. He didn't care what he did to his name. He didn't care what he did to his home. He didn't care. He had no respect for them. And I'll tell you some of our teenagers. Boy, when I see this group of teenagers over here carrying Bibles, uh, and I see teenagers in church and respecting and honoring father and mother, I, I tell you, I respect those teenagers. Uh, thank God for them. Uh, they have to face so much more than we had to face when we were teenagers. Uh, and when a, a young girl says, I'm going to follow Jesus, uh, and a young boy says, I'll pay the price, uh, regardless of what others do, uh, it makes me feel good. Uh, so the first day in the life of the prodigal, uh, it was a sad day. Now notice the second day. It was a bad day. When was it a bad day? When he landed in the pig pen. Oh, listen to me. If you go to the far country, you're going to end up in the hog pen. Now listen to me. Listen to me. You don't, may, may not have to go far. Any place that you're away from God, you're in the far country. Bless God, if it's 50 feet out here in front of this church and you're away from God, brother, you're in a far country. Do you hear me tonight? And here's a young man that went in the far country and the Bible says he landed in that pig pen. You say, why was it a bad day? When he landed in that pig pen, three things were true about him. First of all, he was penniless. He didn't have enough money to buy a piece of bread. The Bible said when he spent all, it's a bad day when a man goes out here and spends his money on booze and gambling and raising the devil and lets his family go lacking. It's a sad day and a bad day, mister. And here's a young man that became penniless, didn't have a thing. One night I'm going to preach on payday every day. Lord willing, about Friday night, R.G. Lee preached in this church, I think, once. And R.G. Lee wrote a book entitled, Payday Someday. And before he died, with his hair white as snow, that great preacher wrote another book called Payday Every Day. Lord of God, it pays to serve Jesus every day in this world. Do you know that? 
And I hear somebody say, "Don't, uh, Brother Mays, I'm sorry for you. Uh, don't you be sorry for me. Uh, God's my Father. Jesus, my elder brother. The Holy Ghost is my comforter. And the devil's not my 42nd cousin anymore. Say amen. Uh, I want you to know, brother, I'm having the best time I've ever had. Uh, I'm enjoying the blessings of God. Uh, and a Christian uh, can have a better time uh, than anyone in this world. Uh, praise God. The sunlight of the gospel shines on him. He's under the blood. He's kept through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you, he's rejoicing in the good things of God, mister. And what a blessing that is. But here it became penis. That crowd that's running after you just to get your money, they don't love you. You hear me? When your money's gone, they won't have anything to do with you. And here's a young man, and he became penniless. Let me give you something that happened in Atlanta. I used to have a broadcast named Broadcasting for Jesus. We have the truck driver special now. But on that broadcast, we had a little time called Kneel at the Cross. Now I know a man in Atlanta that went into his home and in one of the bedrooms made an altar and a cross. Just a cross. Jesus wasn't on it because Jesus is not on the cross. Praise God. God's highly exalted. And I said, what a beautiful place. He, 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 they, he bought his wife a special organ. And she'd pray in that room. And he said, there's my altar. There's where we meet God. But he forgot God. Like the prodigal, he went away from... He had two big automobiles. And I'm not telling you what, what kind. They were very expensive cars. A beautiful home. And years later, I stood with him in the in Decatur at the courthouse. There is where I live. I saw him sell his furniture. I saw him sell his cars. I saw him stand there and tears ran down his cheeks. And I went over and put my arm around him. And I said, Ed! He looked at me and he said, My kids have had to beg for bread. Well, he said, The devil caused me to spend it all, preacher. Spend it all. And as I looked at him, he said, Did your children ever go to bed? Say, I can't go to sleep, Daddy. I'm hungry. And I said, no. Thank God. They've always had something to eat. I, I said, we've had bread on our table. Uh, and praise God, we've had clothes on our backs. Uh, let me tell you something. This boy uh, went down there and he spent all. He became penniless. Uh, number two, he became friendless. That old crowd didn't know him when he had a need. I'd rather have me some Christian friends. Praise the Lord. I mean, somebody can pray for me. Somebody that will go with me. You say, preacher, there's a young man. He became penniless, and then he became friendless. And I want to give you a couple of things about friends. The Bible says, and we'll have to hurry on, because I don't want to keep you too long. This is what the Bible says. Proverbs 17, 17. Oh, it said, a friend loveth at all times. Let me tell you something. When you're down, if you've got a friend, he'll love you. When you're up, praise God, he'll love you. But listen to what the next chapter says. The next chapter said, He that hath friends must first show himself friendly. For there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. There's one will be there, brother, when your own flesh and blood brother will forsake you. There's one named Jesus, and he is a friend to the very end. And what a blessing that is. You say, what happened? He became friendless. Let me tell you about one little friend I had down in Georgia. I've got a lot of friends. Seem like little kids uh, are my friends and old people. I can't do much with this middle-aged crowd, but praise God for the old folks and the kids. Hey, man, boy, these old folks ain't like me. I don't, because they think I'm so old. I preached to a fellow Saturday night. He is uh, 102 years old. And I went back to him, because I, I don't go back to him. It's when I'm up here, I don't ever go back. They said, preacher, he's 102 and he loves you. And he said he hadn't heard you preach in 30 years. And when I went back, I was sure glad I went back. He looked at me, stretched his eyes, and he said, Lord Mays, said, you, you look younger than you did 30 years ago. And I said, well, praise God. Amen. Some of you women are run back there too. Said, tell you that. Say amen. Amen. And I want you to know he looked me in the face and he said, I'm honest with you. You look younger than you did 30 years ago. Are you listening to me tonight? Oh, just as sure as you hear. You'll meet a few friends that will go with you to the end. But there's one that I guarantee you will be the best friend you've ever had. And his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he'll be with you to the very end. 
But let me mention this little fella. He was crippled. Little hands like this. His little feet, he can never walk on. He lived till he was 21 years old. And for the last eight years of his life, he never missed our broadcast every day on the big gun in Atlanta. He lives in Villarica. Or he lived in Villarica, Georgia. His name was Larry Broom. And when I was preaching anywhere around in 100 miles, his daddy had to bring him. And he had a little wheelchair and a battery on the back of him. Boy, his daddy would bring him up there and open the door and he'd say, leave me alone. And he'd have his little Bible between his little legs that were all shriveled up. And he'd push that button and guide that thing down and roll it right up to the platform and said, hi, Maze. And I'd say, hey, Larry, how you doing? Oh, he said, I was thinking about that race we're going to have when I get to heaven. I said, what? He said, we're going to have a race around the tree of life, uh, and I'm going to leave you in the gold dust. Praise God. <laughs> and I'd say, Larry, you're not. He said, yes, sir, I've never had any legs. When I get my two new ones, uh, said, I'll leave you. They won't even know you're in the race. Praise the Lord. And he's one of the sweetest little friends that I've ever had. And what a friend that little boy was. Every two weeks, he'd send me a dollar, uh, and he'd say, Brother Mays, I, I can't work, but... I promise you as long as I can, every two weeks, I'll send you a dollar. And the day that he was to go to the hospital and die two days later, he called his mother and he pushed that button and said, I'll go out to the ambulance myself. And he said, Mama, behind the clock is a letter to Brother Mays. After the funeral, mail it and tell him that I was his friend and I'll be in heaven looking for him. And I want to tell you, Brother Two days after that funeral, I got that letter. And oh, listen what it said, Brother Mays. I've been your friend. But I want to tell you something. While ages roll, I'll still be your friend. We'll walk the streets together. We'll praise the Savior. And his mother put P.S. down there. I mailed it after the funeral. Oh, he loved you, Brother Mays. Let me tell you, this prodigal son, it was a bad because he became penniless then he became friendless and here's the last thing he became shameless he got so he didn't have any respect for God no respect for himself and when people go down so far that they have no respect at all for God's house and no respect for the Bible and no respect for God it's sad I could give you a lot of things about that but I've got to hurry let's come to the glad day Oh, happy day. I'm glad I don't have to stop with the sad day. I'm glad I don't have to stop with the bad day. There came a glad day. You know, when it was when he came to himself. Brother, when I came to myself, listen to me. I was in North Carolina State University taking final exams the second year. Oh, let me tell you something. I was on a Friday night at a quarter to nine. Seat dormitory, room 813. I met the master face to face. I've been a shouting ever since, and you're not going to put a damper on me now. Say amen right there. Boy, I'll tell you, God has been good to me and precious to me, and I'm glad tonight. That night I came to myself. I never will forget. Some of you heard me tell it. I finally got to the phone after going in a drugstore, and all. I'll, I'll not go through that. Now, I lived in Hendersonville, North Carolina. I'm a mountaineer. Somebody said, a mountaineer? You are too, but I'm not ashamed of it. Say amen right there. Some of you are ashamed you came from the mountains, but I'm not. My wife said, just, just talk a little while and they'll know it. Well, amen right there. Amen. Well, that's all right. I'm not ashamed of it. Praise God. I read in the Bible where he said, I lift up mine eyes on the hills, and I want to be where God is. Say amen right there. And what a blessing, my friend, that is. But it was a glad day. That night, God saved me. I went into a phone booth, and it didn't cost but a nickel to get the operator then. It cost a quarter for her to even say, a number, please, now. And I hit that thing, and said, zoop. And that lady said, uh, number, please. And I said, excuse me, praise the Lord. She said, excuse me. And she said, number, please. I said, give me Hendersonville, North Carolina, 7195. We didn't have a prefix then. And she said, just a moment. They had to call Asheville, and Asheville would ring Hendersonville. And I heard the operator say, Asheville... And the Raleigh operator said, would you ring Hendersonville 7195? She said, just a moment. I said, you better hurry. There's going to be some shouting over at Mother's house. And boy, I'll tell you, it wasn't long. It rang once. It rang twice. And when it rang the third time, Mother picked up the phone and said, hello. And I said, hello, 
Lord, that operator said, just a moment, 80 cents. I said, excuse me, praise God. I started feeding that thing like a chicken eating corn. And when I got the money in that operator down at Raleigh, he said, uh, go ahead. I said, mother, I got saved. She said, did what you say? Are you sick? I said, no, I got saved. She hung up, but I heard her shout 180 miles. That's the same. And praise the Lord. What a blessing it was. Oh, somebody said, preacher. It was a happy day. It's always a glad day, mister, when a man comes to himself. Now, it was a glad day for three reasons. Write them down. Uh, first of all, he remembered. Or, or, first, he recognized the mess he was in. Oh, he got tired of those pigs. He got tired of feeding the swine. I never will forget I was preaching in a big Calvary Baptist church down in Columbus, Georgia. Some of you men were over there across in Alabama there, Phoenix City. So, you know, if you went over to Columbus, the big uh, Calvary Baptist church, Dr. Glaze. And I used to go every year down there and preach at that church. And one time I was down there, this little old boy sitting on the front row. He's the smartest guy in the Bible I've ever seen. Boy, he knew the Bible. And I remember, boy, I'd preach on something. He'd come up and ask me a question about it. So one night he came up to me and he said, Brother Mays, he said, how long did the prodigal son stay in the hog pen? I said, just a minute. He said, well, don't you know? I said, wait a minute. And he said, all right, I'm waiting. I said, till he got tired of living with the pigs. Say amen right there. He said, amen. I said, all right, that answers it. Next night he came up to me and I preached on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he said, preacher. You made the mistake all others make, said you left the fourth man in the furnace. Said you brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out, but you didn't say a thing about the fourth man coming out. I said, wait a minute, let me pray. I said, Lord, he's got me sure as a word tonight. And I said, I know why I didn't bring him out. That little old boy said, why? I said, because I may get thrown in. I want him to be in there before I get there. Praise God. Yes, sir. But you know what that little old boy said to me? Next night I preached about Adam. And he said to me, he said, was it raining or sun shining when God created Adam? I said, the Bible didn't say. He said, oh, yes, it does. I said, no, it doesn't. I said, the Bible said in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, let me quote it to you. And the Lord God formed out of dust ground, breathed his mouth, breath of life, and man became a living soul. He said, slow her down. I said, all right. For the Lord God formed man out of dust. He said, stop. He said, if it had been rainy, it had been mud. Hallelujah. So it must have been sun shining. Now, and praise the Lord. But he said, Brother Mays, tell me about that prodigal. I said, he got hungry. He got tired. He got sick of the pig pen. And said, I believe I'll go home. Now listen, he was down there in the hog pen. And he recognized the messes in. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, if I could show you the mess you're in and the judgment that's hanging over you and the hell that's out there in front of you and the misery that you're going through. Oh, listen, you'd get up before I stop preaching and say, hey, I've got to be saved. I don't want to live this kind of life. And so he, first of all, recognized the message. Secondly, he remembered the Father's table back down there. If you ever tasted the Lord, <laughs> I want to tell you something. You'll never forget that. Amen? The devil has nothing like that. See, he's got beef, T-bone steaks. Amen right there. That boy knew where the beef was. He said, I'm telling you, bless God, I know it's the Father's table. He's got bread to spare, and I perish with hunger. He remembered the taste of the Father's food. And folks, don't let the devil's crowd shame you and say, you, you know, listen, we've got everything. Thank God we've got hope and we've got life and we've got peace and we've got joy and we've got victory and we've got everything that we need to make us happy in this world. And I bless the Lord for that. I bless the Lord for that. And so he remembered the Father's house. Not only, my friend, did he recognize the mess he's in, remember the Father's table, but number three, this is the best part. He resolved to go home. The devil said, stay another day. He said, no, sir, devil, I'm a going home. Praise God. The devil will come to you and say, hey, mister, don't you go. And stay, stay, stay. Uh, you don't have to be saved tonight. Uh, 
Did you know there are more people in hell because they said they'd get saved tomorrow night than all of those that have been liquor heads and everything else, procrastination, looking for a better time. There is no better time than tonight, mister. The best time you'll ever have to be saved. Now is the day of salvation. Behold, today is the accepted time. And you need to be saved tonight. What a blessing. Let me give you this. Now I've got to close. I, I'm always usually home on Mondays. We have a lot of work to do there in the office in Atlanta. And uh, uh, I'm always home on Mondays. Several years ago, and I love preacher's kids. Let me say that. I know some of you, you, you say, oh, preacher's kids don't live right. What about them deacons, young ones? Say amen right there. Bless God, they're not little Lord Funeroy. Say amen. Amen. Uh, I hate to hear folks say, well, he's a little old mean preacher's kid. <laughs> well, hell, I've seen some mean free will Baptist young ones running around too, haven't you? Amen? Yeah. Why, you know that's so, but quit, quit picking on the preacher's kid. And I'll tell you, I, I, I'm always sorry for the preacher's wife. If she dresses nice, she's stuck up. And if she doesn't dress nice, uh, she's a, a hindrance to his ministry. She sings in the choir, she's running the choir, she don't... She don't care anything about the church. And you've never seen so many excuses. You know, it's hard, but I'm glad God let me be a preacher. <laughs> I'd hate to have been a preacher's wife. I'll tell you, I told my wife. My wife used to sit when I first started preaching, or when we first got married, and she'd bite her fingernails, afraid I was going to say the wrong thing. And about half the time, I did say the wrong thing. Amen. But boy, we had a time. I'd just preach and shout and enjoy the blessings. I preached back in my old church. Four weeks ago, I preached in a homecoming, and I'd been away 35 years since I'd pastored that church. And boy, God's blessed it, and I, I, I rejoiced. Oh, I rejoiced. But I told them, I said, I never told one of you how to vote. And I had some old saints of God, and they still worship me, and that's bad. Boy, Brother O.A. Roberts, you've heard me talk about him. He and his wife in their 80s. He came up and hugged me and died, and several of Brother Kid went all of them. But the old, old saints of God, and, and I always said, I don't care where Maze is when, he, when I die. And when I go to heaven, I want him to fly in and preach my funeral. Said, Maze preached to me when he was a kid. And Maze stood up and preached and cried and helped me with my kids. And I love Maze. And that's bad when you, get a, you worship a preacher. You should respect your preacher, but don't worship the preacher. My, mother, my wife used to say they got Mays Jackson religion, and they might have had. But boy, I'd preach to them hard. I never preached on checkers in my life. I don't know what, I've never played checkers in my life. I never played checkers in my life. But I could walk down the street where I pastored, and they'd be in a store, a bunch of them playing checkers, and they'd holler, Yonder comes Mays! And they'd throw checker boys everywhere you ever saw in your life. I'm telling you, they got rid of checkerboards, and checkers and everything else. Boy, they said, oh, man, he's hard on us. But I used to tell them, I said, I'm not telling you how to vote, but I'm going to put my chair in three feet of the ballot box, and every one of my members that goes in there and votes wrong, I'm going to pray God will kill him. If you come rolling out, I'll know you voted wrong. Amen? And, boy, I want to tell you, they all came standing up when they came out, so they voted right. Say amen right there. Amen. I believe that God's people ought to stand up. I believe God's people ought to be counted, brother. I want to be counted for righteousness. I don't want your little girl to say when I leave here, son, oh, man, it's a stumbling block. He didn't stand for the Bible and truth and righteousness. I want her to say when I'm gone, Daddy, I believe Brother Mays loves God. I believe he's a true man of God. And that ought to be the way. But I love preacher's kids. And I was in Atlanta on Monday night several years ago, and my phone rang, and I have preachers all the time coming to Atlanta. They never come to see me now. They either go to Six Flags or uh, they go to see the Falcons or the Hawks or Buzzards or something down there. I don't know what they're going to see. But they used to call me and they'd come down and I, I'd say, Hello! And they'd, they'd change their voices. One old fellow when Martin Luther King died, changed his voice. Oh, white preacher, I knew he was. He said, uh, he said, Did you know Martin Luther King got shot? I said, Yeah, I'm going to sing at his funeral. Bless God, he hung up. He didn't bother me. Hey, Amen! But they're bad. Them preachers, you know, they'd call me. And they'd call me and cry and make out like this. Lost and want me to meet them downtown. And said, but one Monday night, I, I picked up the phone and a young boy said, uh, uh, Brother Mays? And I said, yes. 
And I knew that it was sincere, that a boy was really weeping. I said, can I help you, son? And he said, you know, my daddy, you've helped him in meeting after meeting. He said, preacher, 11 months ago, I left home. I haven't written a letter. I haven't called them. They don't know whether I'm living or dead. And I'm down here at the bus station in Atlanta. I haven't eaten in three days. And I'm tired. And a policeman, a policeman got in touch with you. And he was so nice. Called the radio station and got your number. And said, preacher, I, 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 I'm hungry, but I don't want you to come down here for that. He said, I need to get to God. Would you come and lead me to Jesus? I said, son, I live on Covington Highway. I said, if you wait where you are at that bus station, I'll be down as quick as I can. I ran out and got my car, went out on Covenant Highway, went around 285, went down to 20 into Kane Street. That's where the bus station is in Atlanta. Pulled up behind the bus station. I was in such a hurry to find a parking place, and I couldn't find one. And I saw no parking place. And I said, well, praise God, I ain't got time to hunt a parking place. I mean, somebody wanting to get saved, and I pulled in that no parking place. A policeman said, I said, yes. He said, can't you read, buddy? I said, yes, but I'm a preacher. He said, go ahead. And I said, go over to God. That's one time it pays to be a preacher. And I went in that bus station, and it was going from Maine to Miami, and over there in the corner was an old boy. He was on his knees and had long beard and long hair. I went over and slipped my arm around him, and he said, preacher, all I want to do is to go to heaven. I want to go back home and hug my daddy and mom and get in the church and let my daddy baptize me. I want to serve the Lord till I die. Then he told, I mean, we had a time, Bobby. We had a time. And while they was going to Maine and Miami and Jacksonville, me and he was going to heaven. Say amen right there. Boy, I want to tell you, the Lord came down, saved that old boy, and I got recapped myself. Say amen right there. Boy, you talk about something good. It was good. I jumped up and I said, son, you wait right here. And I went over to the ticket office or the line there and I said to the man I said what time you got a bus uh, express bus going up near Greensboro North Carolina he said we got one going in 20 minutes I said give me a one-way ticket he gave me a one-way ticket and I paid for it and I went over and called the boy's mother and dad and the mother answered and she said Maze how you doing I said fine she said my boy I thought it might be him I answer every call I said Clyde pick up the phone it's brother Maze Brother Clyde picked up the phone. He said, Mace, you haven't seen my boy, have you? I said, yeah, I'm looking at him right here in this bus station. Looks better than I've ever seen him in his life. I said, he just got up from getting saved. And I said, in 18 minutes, I'm going to put him on a bus. And in six hours and 15 minutes, uh, he'll be in that little town. I won't give you the name of the town outside of Greensboro. But I said, there, there where you live, Clyde, is a shell filling station. Behind it's a little bus station. And I said, you be there. I said, in six hours and 33 minutes, he'll be home. Clyde said, no, I'll come get him. I said, no, you won't. I've already got his ticket. He said, I'll send you the money. I said, no, you won't. He's riding home on me. Praise God. I said, I'm going to feed him before he gets on that bus so he won't be hungry going home. I hung up, went over and told that boy. I had his ticket, and I said, come, let's eat. Have you ever been in the bus station in Atlanta? They have a big old cafeteria, and I, I went over with him. I said, get your tray. And uh, he said, Kentucky Fried Chicken or something. I said, get you some. Praise God. And he said, country style steak. I said, praise God, get you some. And he looked over and he said, uh, uh, flounder. I said, get you some. I said, Lord, he's going to break me, bless God. But I want him to get some. And boy, he got some, you know. And we went over and I've never eaten the steak and, and, and fish with tears. But after he got through praying, I made him say the blessing. And all he could say is, Lord, thank you for saving me. And I'm going home, Lord. I'm going home. I'm tired. And I'm going home. And boy, when he got through, I said, son, you've got about uh, 12 minutes. You better start eating. And about two minutes from that, they made the first announcement. Let's see if I can announce it. They said, Greyhound Line, all points north, gate 18, 10 minutes departure. I said, son, that's you. You'll have to hurry. And we went out there in about five minutes, and there's the nicest bus driver, had his little cap on, he's clicking tickets. I raised my hand. He said, oh, that's all right with you, son. I know how it is, father and son. <laughs> well, that was so. I was his spiritual daddy, praise God. I wasn't going to deny that. I said, thank you, yeah. I thank you, sir. Finally, he said, you'll have to get on the bus, son. And our old boy hugged me and said, preacher, if I don't see you no more here, I'll look for you over there in the city of God. But I want to thank you that I came home to God tonight. That boy got on the bus. He got up there and he'd stand. He was waving. That bus driver got on, pulled that big silver door to, 
and let the air out of the brakes, started backing up to go down to King Street to go down and hit 85 to go north. And as he started backing out, I was waving at that boy. And when the bus backed out and started out to King Street, I was walking right along with it. He's driving slow. That policeman joined me. You're at that, that, and, and he's walking along. I was a crying, waving, bye. I'll be praying for you. And I looked around. That policeman had taken off his cap. I believe he went two feet further. He'd have pulled off his gun, praise the Lord. I believe he'd have done something, brother. He might have spilled some water or something like that. But I want you to know, he walked along, and brothers, he did. I waved at that boy out of sight. I went home and got my clock and went down stairs in the basement and set my clock 15 minutes before that bus was to arrive. I got up the next morning. It's still dark, and I could see that old big bus going past Greensburn, headed for this little town. Five minutes before it got there, I could see him climbing the last hill. Then three minutes and two minutes. And I could see Clyde and his wife standing out there at that little bus station with their hands waving at that bus as was coming in. And I could see the bus driver open the door and that boy fall in his arms. And I hollered, Woo! Hallelujah! And I went upstairs after that. My wife said, why in the world are you hooing and hallelujah so early this morning downstairs? I said, you ought to have been there. Oh, that boy got home. I said, praise God, Clyde and his wife met him. And sure enough, it was just like I said. They couldn't wait. They, they were there at 3 o'clock in the morning waiting on that bus to come. And somebody said, preacher, I'm glad that that boy said I've resolved. I will arise and go home. And that night he went home. If you're here tonight and you're away from God, oh, you can get up and say, I believe I'll go home. And you can come to the Father and he'll run and meet you and fall on your neck and have compassion and kiss you. Thank God this boy went home. Every head bowed, every eye closed all out. Thank you for listening. And while Brother Phil gets us, we get ready, I want you to keep your head bowed for just a moment. And I want to ask you something. Are you away from God? Are you away from God? Now, I, I don't want you to go unless you just have to. Now, the preacher just left told me tonight he had to leave at 9 o'clock or a little before to get some folks to work. And I said, you just feel free. So we're not worrying about when people have to go, they have to go. And I said, preacher, I'm glad you came, brought your folks. But if you're here tonight, this is the most important part of this service. I mean, this is more important than the singing. This is more important than the preaching. Because now we're to come to the place where we pull the net. I wonder if there's a mother away from God. I wonder if there's a daddy that's away from God tonight. I wonder if there's a son or daughter and you're away from God tonight. Oh, you can come home. Listen while they play softly. And, and I, I'm going to give the invitation in just a moment. But I want you to listen. Oh, what a blessing. Yes. Thank God. The Lord's speaking to hearts. Just as I am, that's the way God wants you. The old prodigal got up. He didn't take a bath. He didn't go to the finest wardrobe and find a new suit. He got up just as he was. And he said, I'm going home. In his rags. He went home barefooted. And the father ran and fell on his neck and kissed him and said, welcome home. Thank God he'll do the same for you tonight. I wonder first, I'm going to ask two questions tonight or three. Just, just two questions or maybe three. First, I'm going to ask you, how many of you have got a prodigal son? Or how many of you have got a prodigal daughter? And, and, and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed for that boy or that girl. Maybe you don't even know where they are tonight. Maybe you don't know what their whereabouts. But if you're here tonight, and you've got a prodigal son or prodigal daughter, and you'd like for me to pray for them, and the church to pray for them. Raise your hand, let us pray tonight. That's right, all over the house. God bless you. Let's believe God. Let's believe God tonight. All right, you can take your hands down. Let me ask you another question. You say, preacher, I want you to know I'm a Christian, but I've lived so cold, and I feel like the prodigal. I'm away from God. 
And Brother Mays, I need to get up and come down that altar and say, Lord, I'm just going to draw nigh to you tonight. I want to come home as a Christian. And I want you to receive me and kiss away my sins tonight. Would you raise your hand, Christian? Let me see it tonight. God bless you and God bless you and God bless you. Just step up your hand. Let me see it. I tell you, if you're away from God, God bless you over here. Here's another. Just lift up your hand. I want to pray for you tonight. Would you hold up that hand? Let me see it. Lift it up. Let me see it. All right, let me ask you another question. How many people say, Preacher, I, I don't know the Lord. I'm like that old boy, away from God, away from home. I want you to pray for me. I'm tired. I'm like him. I'm sick of the fog pen. I'm tired of the far, far country. Slip up that hand. Let me see it. Would you lift it up tonight? I want to pray for you. Lift it up high, right there in your seat. I want to pray for you. God bless you. Is there another? Let me see that hand. Let me see that hand. Is there one more? While I wait just a moment, you say, Preacher, I'm away from God. I want you to pray for me. Slip up that hand. Let me see it tonight. Would you lift it up? Is there another? While we wait just a moment, Father, thank you for these that heard the message. Oh, I'm glad he resolved to go home. He said, I'll arise and go to my Father. Lord, there's some people here tonight. You've dealt with them. They need to rise and come home. They need to get up in this invitation in just a moment, just as they are. They need to come tonight in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Look this way. We're going to stand in a moment. We're going to sing a song. I don't think you need a book, just as I am without one plea. And I want you to come back down this aisle. I want to ask three different, uh, three different classes of people. First, I want you, if you've got a prodigal girl, if you've got a prodigal boy and you want to really see him get right with God like that boy did down in Atlanta and come home and live for Jesus. You know, if I, I got three sons and six grandchildren, and if I thought one of them, of course, some of my grandchildren are too young, but I'm glad those that are old enough have been saved. My boys are all serving God tonight. That's the best thing in the world. But if they were not, I'd be at this altar for this. Uh, if I had a daughter or a son that was out in sin, I'd get in this altar. And then if you're here tonight and you're a Christian and you've wandered out from the church and away from God, so to speak, you need to come. Get out and say, Lord, I'm coming home. And if you're here tonight and you've never been saved, you need to get up and come right on down here. And I'm glad the dear preacher here and others will meet you. And we'll pray with you. Everybody standing, everybody singing. Come right on tonight. If you're in one of those categories, come right on. We're going to need you right at this altar. Come right on. Brother Mays, I want to come. God speak to me. I want to come tonight. Come right on tonight. We'll pray. Amen. Thy blood was shed for me. Oh, yes. You come right on. And that. Thank God. Oh, oh Lamb of God, I come. Of God, I come. Now you keep coming. We're going to sing the second stanza. Come at all while we sing the second stanza. Oh, you sing for you. Stop speaking to me. I'm at waiting now. Yes, thank to God. To read my soul. To read my soul. I come, I come. I come. Now I want you to look this way just a moment. I want you to sing that last stanza in a moment. But I believe there's some of you mothers back there and you feel an urge to come down here and get on your knees tonight. I believe there's some daddies here that God's really dealing with. And I mean the Spirit of God's drawing you. I believe you need to come tonight. And I believe there's some of these young people over here. Oh, some of these precious boys and girls. They got a life out there before them. And I believe they need to come, many of them, and get down here and say, God, I want to be in your house, and I want to be faithful to God. And I believe there's some here tonight, if you were to die for this service, you'd go to hell. My friend, think about that. Why don't you say like that old prodigal, I'll arise, and I'm going to get right with Jesus. 
I'm going to get saved tonight. I'm going to call on his name. I'm going to believe that he died in my place and accept him. Whatever your need is, we're going to sing one more stanza and we're going to pray with all these here at the altar. Would you come? This Just is the last stanza. Come on. Come on. There's many more need to come. That's why I'm coming. Brother Mays, I need to come. Come on. We're going to meet you right there right at the front. We're going to meet you right here at the front. Praise God. We're going to meet you right here at the front. I believe in the Lamb of God I come, I come. All right, let's bow our heads just a moment. Thank you, Brother Phil, and thank you, ladies, for playing. Listen tonight. I, I, I want you to just play another stand so softly with heads bowed. I want you, I want you to hear me tonight. Folks, this is Monday night. Oh, I prayed all day today. I said, Holy Spirit, move upon the crusade. Let people be God conscious. Oh, I prayed. I said, God, I know the singing will be good. The people will be friendly and kind there. And I said, Brother Adams will greet everybody. But oh, I said, Holy Spirit, unless you come, Unless you move on mothers and show them their needs. Unless you move on daddies. Unless you move on sons and daughters. It won't be what it ought to be. So I want to say something. While they play softly, would you step on out and come down here for this prayer? Come on. Now listen, God wants to do something for you tonight. Not all of you come that God wants to do for. Come on down here tonight. God wants to do something for you, mother. God wants to do something for you, daddy. God wants to do something for you, boy or girl. Would you come right on down? Would you do it? We're going to wait just a few seconds while they finish playing this sweet refrain of this old song. Would you come? Step out. Come on. That's right. Just keep coming. Just keep coming. Move on out. Let's kneel here to mercy. Just keep coming. Play it again. That's still coming. Come on. Now you step out. Listen, we're going to stop in just a few moments. But I, I tell you, I said, God, I want you to move. Lord, I want you to stir our hearts tonight. Help us to love thee and love the Father's house and the blessings of God. And oh, I said, Lord, get some folks to move up closer. And may somebody get up out of the hog pen and come to Jesus. Oh, friend, I'm glad tonight he's waiting. Would you come? In just a few seconds, we're going to pray. I'd like to pray for you. Brother Adams is here at the front. To wait on you to see if he can help you. Would you come? Would you do it? Would you do it? Our Father, I thank you tonight that that young man came to himself. Oh, happy day. Happy day when people come to that place. They see where they are. They see themselves. As the prodigal saw himself. And oh God. I'm glad tonight. That we can come. And I'm glad that we can pray. Many of these mothers are praying for sons and daughters here tonight. Oh God. Many nights they wet their pillow. With a Niagara scald in tears. Many nights they can't sleep. Because of a wayward son or wayward daughter. Here's some daddies down here praying. And I, I pray you will lay a burden upon our hearts in this meeting this week. May this crusade be one that will be eternally, eternally valuable. Oh, may it not be just a passing fantasy, but I pray that heaven will be populated. And oh, God, that your people will love you and that you'll do something every night for every person that comes. Lord, I want to pray again for everybody at this altar. Meet every need. Touch every soul. Thank you for what you're doing. And now, Father, bless everyone that came to this meeting, especially the good preachers. God, I, I pray you'll bless these preachers. There may be a preacher here not discouraged. Oh, God, there may be a preacher going up the rough side of the mountain. Bless that preacher. And, Father, that little mother, that dad, son, or daughter, have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
and amen. God bless you. Look this way, Brother Adam. Oh, wasn't that good? Amen. Praise the Lord. God can move, and we appreciate that tonight. Tomorrow night, the Hunter First Baptist Church Youth Choir that will fill this choir up here will be singing and also their quartet. Now, preachers, on Wednesday night, it wasn't really the way we'd planned it. We'd hoped we could get the inspirations another night, but they were tied up every night this week in Gatlinburg, but Wednesday night. And I know that's your prayer meeting, and, but the inspirations will be coming here on Wednesday night. And we got something every night. Little Chris Purnell sung at the National Quartet Convention last week, 12 years old, from Spartanburg, South Carolina. will be here Friday night. Going to have some good things, good preaching every night. Don't want to miss it. You know, uh, Sunday morning we had uh, several getting right with God. One man got saved, and he was in prayer room last night and tonight both. Uh, the lady that got saved last night's back tonight. Brenda, good to see her. Different ones of you that's got right with God. That's what it's all about. And uh, we praise God for every decision. Just a moment, we are going to let you out of here. We're going to have some good tapes. Now, last year, we got some the message real good. Didn't get the music all that good uh, at the big tent meeting, as you remember, last year. Now, some people got a hold of a bad tape. We put out a lot of tapes. And you might got a hold of a tape that was a bad tape, and you never did bring it back. If you'll let Brother Phil myself know, uh, we'll get you a tape from that crusade last year. We'll make those tapes right. Lady just saw the reason I mentioned that. A lady mentioned the other day, said she'd paid for a whole set and hadn't got them. I said, man, why didn't you call us before now? And we shot those tapes to her this last week, and it's been a year now. So uh, if you have a bad tape, you see us. But now, we've got all of our taping equipment up in our sound room. All these tapes are going to be just as clear as they can be. And you can get them tonight's message right out front here. Tonight's message. If some of you preachers want to preach that, you don't have to worry jotting it down now. You can take that message and hear it over and over and kind of get your points built behind it and tell your people Sunday morning where the beef is. Amen. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, boy, I tell you, you can find a whole lot more beef at the Father's house than down there at the hog pen. <laughs> There's pork down there. <laughs> there wasn't any beef down there, were there? <laughs> uh, those tapes are $3 right out front there. you get a good tape, all right? It's good that you're here. Tell somebody about the meeting. Let's get in here and do something for Jesus, okay? Brother Gibson from Valley Forge, he's new here from up in Ohio. We're glad to have him. Would you dismiss us in a word of prayer?